Hi everyone, this is Anne of Fiber Floss and Fiction. Welcome back to the next installment in my knitting, uh, reading, and cross stitch podcast. Today is Friday, um, the 7th of October, and I am coming to you today, as usual, from the mountains of northern New Mexico. I hope everybody has had a good start to the month. I'm a little bit late. It's not really late because I'm not trying to operate on a specific schedule right now, but uh, it's been about three weeks since the last time I podcasted, so I'm here to catch you up with a bunch of stuff. Um, my husband and I went away last weekend to Southern Colorado to Durango and Silverton to enjoy the fall foliage, which was great. We had a really, really nice, really very relaxing time, which was definitely needed and all good. Um, so I have sort of an extra week worth of stuff to talk to you all about. So I think we'll probably get right into it. If you are a new viewer, welcome. I hope that you choose to click the subscribe button and come back and visit with me for more content. And of course, if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. I'm always delighted to spend a little time with you and see you here in the world of, of YouTube. Um, trying to think if I had any admin type stuff. I don't, I don't think I do. Um, so yeah, normal podcast format today. There will be the timestamps for each of the three sections in case one of them isn't your jam. Um, and this will probably be a longer one. You all will know more than I when you look at the timestamp, but I have a fair amount of things to talk about. So let's just get right on into it. And we're gonna start with knitting. So let's talk about what I have been knitting. Uh, I guess first off, let's talk about what I'm wearing. I don't think that you all have seen this. This is the Love Note sweater, uh, which I knit during my podcasting hiatus. Uh, it is a super pa popular pattern uh, with a yoke neck construction. So it's, it's a circular knit with this pretty lace pattern on the top. Uh, I knit mine using McMullen fibers. I held one strand of their, it's their cashmere sock base. I can't remember if it's posh sock. I think that might be it. With one strand of their silk lace mohair. So it has kind of a like fuzzy, fluffy sheen in the colorway Desert Rose, which I really like. It is, um, pink obviously but it has these little speckles of this sort of coppery color throughout and this really nice lace pattern so it is it has turned fall here so it, it's not quite cold enough for like a full full-on sweater but this is actually very warm for its weight um, and if you're interested in this or any of the other finished pieces that I have to share with you guys you can head on over to Ravelry. I will link to my account down below. Uh, and you can see all of the, the details for modifications or anything like that, that I made. So this is an older finished piece, not something that you would have seen in the last three episodes. Okay, but let's talk about what I have finished since we last talked. Uh, the first thing I will share is a finished pair of socks. These are for the Falling Leaves Sock Cow. I think that's right. I'll put the hashtag down below, 2022. That's being hosted by Earth Tone Girl, Earth Tones Girl, uh, Denise, who is a prolific sock maker. Um, and she's hosting a fall sock knit along where the goal is to knit two socks, two pairs of socks from October 15th to November 15th. So this is the first of my pairs. Basic, um, just plain vanilla sock. Uh, this time I did a 66 stitch circumference rather than 64. Uh, the yarn base that I used is from a company called Fiber Stash and it's in her Twinkle Toes 
face. You might even be able to see some of the shimmer. Um, so it's a sock yarn, but it has a little bit of Stellina in it uh, that's gold. And I love how it looks, uh, but I also know from having worked with this base before that sometimes it runs a little bit small on gauge when I work with it. So I just added a couple stitches to my normal 64 stitch circumference. Uh, just a regular knit one purl one rib. My kind of go-to sock heel, uh, which is the Fish Lips Kiss Heel. And so I did contrast toes and heels in some leftover The Unique Sheep Lux sock base in the colorway Sinful. And the Fiber Stash Dye Works colorway, uh, which is this speckled mottled multicolor one is called Hayride, which I think is perfect for the season. It's all the fall leaf colors and I love it. I am not sure why I waited so long to knit these up, but here we go. They are finished. So now that I have shown those to you all, I will probably be wearing them at some point in the next day or two just to kick off fall. Maybe tomorrow I'm going out for coffee and I might wear those as like a fun, fun addition. Um, the next thing I'll show you guys is another pair of finished socks. Let me get these on the sock blockers. <clears throat> these are ones that you saw that I had started last podcast, but I have gotten finished up. And they are part of my socks A to Z personal sock knitting challenge that I'm doing to knit um, a pair of socks for every letter of the alphabet, and these are B. Okay. Let's just let's get going on these. Um, these are the Brighton socks. The pattern is by Rachel Coopy of Coop Knits, and the pattern comes with, I believe it's three foot sizes and two leg uh, height sizes. So I did the short leg, short er leg, and the middle size for the foot. But um, so normally I, like I told you with these socks, these were 66 stitches around. This pattern in the middle size was 72 stitches around and the small size was 60. So I knew the 60 was going to be too, uh, too small a circumference. So I opted to go and knit the middle size, which was 72 stitches, which worked out great for the color work, which normally, you know, pulls in when you work it. I did go up a needle size from a US one to a US two to knit the color work, which I would normally do for stranded knitting. Um, and they fit absolutely perfectly. The calf is great. Um, and then when I got down to the foot, when I was working the gusset, I moved the stitches around so that I would have 35 stitches on the top of my foot and the rest of the stitches for the sole. And I decreased extra stitches um, all around on my gusset here, just more than was called for in the pattern so that I wound up with 33 stitches down here and that was a smaller foot circumference that fit me better. And then when I got to the toes, since you need an even number of stitches, equal number of stitches on the top and the bottom, I just moved one stitch and then worked the toe decrease. So the, these are knit in West Yorkshire Spinners Signature 4-ply in the colors Dusty Miller, which is this gray. Has a little bit of a greenish tinge to it, but that that's pretty close to reality. Um, amethyst and then black current bomb for the brighter pink, pinky purple. These have been in my queue forever. I am sad that I did not knit them sooner because I love them. I think they're, they're great. Uh, super warm, as you might guess, because this is all double, you know, it's stranded knitting. So you've got, uh, you're carrying two 
strands of yarn, you're carrying a strand of yarn across the back plus the one you're knitting with. Um, you could knit these with a slightly shorter, short version of the leg. And I think one of the Ravelry pattern pictures shows that where um, I think it's just this band and this band. It might even just be this one, to be honest. And then the rest is um, gray. And so there's less real estate on either side of that. Might even just be that section. I think that's what it is. One of these uh, narrow bands, the wide band and one more narrow band. And then the, the person who knit them didn't knit that depth in plain gray. They just started right there. So there's lots of options because each of these is a separate pattern. This is one pattern. These are separate patterns. So you could mix and match if you only wanted to do just this at the cuff. That I think would be very pretty as well. So, um, so yeah, so B is for Brighton. These are finished and we'll go in the sock drawer. Okay, next um, I have two other finished quick pieces. I'm going to talk about um, a new challenge, I guess I'll call it, that I'm participating in. I will talk about that after we finish the finished objects. But just know that these two pieces were knit from yarn that has been in my stash since at least 2007, possibly and probably longer. I'm pretty sure like this was yarn that my parents brought me back from the UK. Maybe the year I got married. My folks used to go to the UK a lot more often. So anyway, they got a lot of yarn because that's always what I said I would like. They'd go to Liberties of London and shop the Rowan counter, and this is Rowan, uh, Rowan Yarns. Anyway, side tangent. Um, Rowan DK Tweed, which I think 99.99% .99 sure is discontinued, but it's a great Tweedy yarn. You can see all the little flecks in it. This is the colorway Dark Emerald. And I knit this long and very cushy um, waffle stitch scarf. There's, I think, two or three free patterns on Ravelry, but you can see it's kind of got a waffle texture, hence the name. And once I finished that up and I still had some yarn left, I went ahead and I cast on, um, the pattern is called Dots and Lines by Justina Lorkowski, Lorkowska, I think is her name, Letty's Knits. And this is not the same texture, and I don't know if it's showing up great, but uh, it has a very similar kind of nubbly texture to it. It's quite fun to knit um, and knits up very quickly. It's uh, slightly slouchy on me, but I think it would be slightly slouchy on most people. It's a very generous knit uh, circumference. So while these are not perfect matches, I think that they would, you know, go fine together as like a gift set. And so I've earmarked these to go into the uh, shelter holiday gift bag thing that my mom's church does every year in November. So I figured that would just be a nice set. It's pretty unisex. And so it could go either for um, a man or a woman and would fit most people's noggins in some way, shape or form. And then of course the scarf will fit whomever. Okay. So that is all. Oh, nope. One more finished thing. This one's hand spun. Let's do, do that before we move on. So this is a finished skein. Uh, this is a gradient, but it is very hard to see. It's the three darkest colors in a nine gradient set that I have. It is that dark purpley gray color with some pops of um, this kind of cranberry silk in it. 
The colorway is Moon River, and the original yarn, original fiber, is a wool silk blend from Hilltop Fiber. And I have two 140 gram packs, and what I and the colors are divided up because they're hand carded. And the colors are divided up into nine gradient shades. And this skein, which is fingering weight two ply and was about 430 yards, um, is the darkest set, the first set of three. So I will be working on the other colors moving lighter in the gradient set next, but I have not started those yet this month. I think I'm gonna wait and use them for an event that starts on the 11th and I may wind up spinning smaller skeins just because it's only a two week event and I'm not sure I can get through, you know, 800 yards of singles that are plied to make a 400 yard skein. We'll see. Anyway, that is done. I love it. It is beautiful and soft. I love her blends. Um, but that is my last finished thing. So let's go on and I will be right back and we'll talk about whips. Things that I have on my needles currently include just a few things. And I have sitting over on my work table a new set of some smaller stuff that I want to get cast on this weekend. I've got two hats that I want to knit this month and another pair of fun fall themed socks. So I haven't started any of those. I just, I have the yarn wound up. Um, so you'll see those next time I come to talk to you. In the meantime, I am working on a single skein shawl project. The pattern is called Rosewater and the designer is Janina Calio, who is Woolenberry. And I've knit several of her patterns and they're all, they're great not beginner beginner patterns but they have just enough of some really great details to be interesting to knit none of them are super complex so if you're an adventurous knitter definitely you could work these um, but they're fun to just use up a skein of fingering weight yarn if you caught I think it was last video I had finished a scarf of hers out of a gradient set of purples called terrain that was a lot of fun and so this is Rosewater, and I am in the home stretch on it. This is all I knit on while we were driving around Southern Colorado in the car, because uh, my husband likes to drive and I do not, so I knit. Um, it is a garter stitch pattern, so the top is just straight knit. And then the bottom is this really pretty lace pattern, which I will show off better once it's blocked, but looks super complex, yet is, it is not. It is really not. And this is a long crescent-shaped shawl, so you could wear it like as a scarf wrapped. Um, yeah, so I have, I think it's six more rows left to, to knit it, left, left in it to knit, and it will be finished up. Uh, I am using a skein of Serendipidize, Serendipidi Fibers by Luscious Yarn Base, which is indeed luscious. It is a uh, alpaca silk cashmere blend. It is gorgeous. It is so soft. Uh, I think the first podcast that I did when I came, kind of came back from my hiatus, I showed a a big green shawl that I had knit and it's the same yarn base that I'm knitting up for Jocelyn's shop. So um, almost there, hoping to have it done this weekend. So we'll see how that goes. So that is on the needles. And then I have two other projects that I'll talk about. Um, this one is kind of on hold until I get some of the other smaller things done, but it is the Gone to Seed top, which I did actually start in September, and I think I showed you guys as like a September plan. Um, Jen Parasini is the designer, and this is a v-neck, short-sleeved, kind of 
vest slash top that you could wear by itself over a cami, over a tank top, over a t-shirt, kind of like I have on today for a, another layer, if you will. Um, and I really liked the concept of the design on it because it's very different. It's not like a standard construction, which is very interesting to me. So anyway, I'm knitting this from the fiber company's Meadow, which is a blend of llama, silk, linen, and merino. Um, you can kind of see the linen that doesn't take the dye the same way. And this is the pokeweed, yeah, pokeweed colorway, which is kind of a dark cranberry color. And I really don't have much done. Um, this is a very lightweight yarn. It's lighter than fingering weight, which is like sock weight, um, but not quite lace weight. So to start the construction, you knit the lace panel that is the shoulder. It's gonna live up here. And then you pick up stitches here, and then you knit down working short rows, which is why this is on kind of a diagonal. So this is the front V neckline that will kind of curve that way. And these are these pretty little lace details that are on either side of the neck. And then the rest is just, it's gonna be stockinette the rest of the way down to the bottom hem. So you knit these two lace panels. I have both of those done. You pick up, you knit each side, right? So here's side one, and then you do side two, and then you pick up across this side and knit the back. So this is basically like your shoulder seam. And once that's done, then you would attach the sleeves here. So like I said, not very far along. Uh, I've had other priorities that I wanted to get to first, but I did at least cast it on, and this will be my focus once I get through some other fall knitting. It's not really seasonal in the sense that I probably won't wear, like it'll, by the time I have it done, it'll be cold enough that I want to wear thicker, heavier sweaters, but it'll be great for spring. So looking forward to having that. And then I'm working on a bigger shawl project. Um which I don't have a picture of, but I will put the link down below. It is from the 52, 52 Weeks of Shawls collection, but you can also purchase it as a standalone pattern. Uh, it is, the designer is Becca Knits, and it is a full-sized shawl. Um, and you may recall just a few minutes ago when I was talking about the socks A to Z, I also want to do a shawls A to Z because I have a lot of patterns in my stash of both socks and shawls. And this is the first one. It is, uh, the pattern is named Aloft. So A is for Aloft. And when I closed out my shop, I went through a bunch of different bins and things and I had three skeins left of a custom spin that I had done for um, some Lace Club members membership packages eons ago, um, like 15 years ago, long time ago. Anyway, um, when the mill spun this up, this base originally was alpaca wool and silk noil. So it would have like little tweedy silk flecks in it of kind of a moss green. And when the mill spun it up, they ran out of silk noil for the last pound, basically. So I have three skeins. You'll see the other one in a minute. But this is what the base yarn looks like. Um, the fiber name is Celestial, and this is the colorway Milky Way. It I would have liked it better to have had the green um, silk in it, but the yarn base is just, it's too nice not to use. And I had the perfect amount to make the shawl, so sold. Um, so I have cast on and I have worked the first full pattern repeat and then I'm halfway through the second one. And here is where it is. Let me try to get you guys a detail of 
that lace. So there's little uh, tiny bobbles. You can see these little nubs that are there. Um, and then there's this chevron pattern in the lace that looks kind of like wings. So this is a very large triangular shawl. It has some nice details in it. Um, it has an I-cord edging here at the top, and then that's also what will finish off the shawl. The charting is a little bit weird. The, I'm 90% sure that the designer is an American, but sh her charting... The publishing company is not American. I don't know if they changed the, how the chart was done to like suit their standards, but it's definitely not a typical charting. And it took, there's, I'm not the only one that it took a little bit of time to figure out like how this was laid out in the charts. But once you get it, then it all makes perfect sense and you can just cruise along on it. So, um, I have enough yarn to do five total repeats, which is the largest size. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that I can get there. Um, I have a deadline on this by like the third week in November. So I need to focus on it. But the nice thing about the pattern is you can knit either three, four or five repeats. And depending on how much yarn you have, you can stop at the end of any of those. So if I'm running short on time, I can always finish it a little bit sooner because it it's going to be massive by the time I get, like I said, this is only one and a half repeats and potentially I could knit five total ones. So anyway, that is where I am on that. Um, and that is once I finish the Rosewater shawl, this will be my focus for the weekend. So I wanted to make one quick mention of... <laughs> Uh, challenge that I'm going to be compete, not competing in doing, completing, let's go with completing, um, that's going to run the next 18 months. And the name of it is Race to the Bottom. It is being hosted by the Stash Down Group in Ravelry. And in theory, uh, 18 months to knit to your stash. Well, that's not going to happen for me. However, one thing that is on my list to do is to really, really, really focus on getting through some of the stash I have that is absolutely lovely yarn, should not be sitting in a bin, it should be made into something nice. So um, there's different levels of yardage you can go for, try for. So I've picked mine plus a stretch goal. And so I am publicly stating this to help keep myself accountable for the rest of this year, all of 2023. And then I think it's through March, the end of March of 2024. And so I'm going to be focusing on working through some older stash. I'm not going to just do old stash, but um, digging deep and trying to match up projects that either I just want to work with the yarn because it's beautiful and maybe I don't want to keep the project, but I have some place that it could be donated um, or actually work on some things for my wardrobe. And um, I realized when I went through to get warm socks to wear on our first cold day here that even though I've knit a lot of socks, I've actually gifted most of them away. So I, I have like six pairs total, even though I've probably knit six pairs in the last three months. I just don't keep them normally. So I need to start looking for things like that that I want to put into my wardrobe and keep going on. I will put a link to the group on Ravelry down below if you're able to access Ravelry. Um, it's, you know, it's a work at your own pace. It's pick your own projects. It's just a nice combination of things that I was looking for to help motivate me to knit from knit more from stash. Um, it will be interesting to see. I'm going to see how much yardage I can get, but it will be it will be a good challenge to push me to do that to work on yardage out of my stash. Okay, enough rambling about that. Let's move on. We're going to talk about books next. 
Next, we're going to talk about books. Uh, and I have a lot to talk about, so I'm going to move through them kind of quickly. If you have questions about any of them, want to know more details, please just ask. I'm happy I'm happy to talk books anywhere. Uh, okay, let's start with Flower Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, I finally, well not finally, I finished this book in three days. Uh, I just started it at our last podcast. It is a nonfiction book. It talks about this series of murders or questionable deaths that happened to members of the Osage Indian tribe who lived in Oklahoma in the 20s. The tribe members, when they were displaced from their original, more Eastern lands, when moved and were moved to Oklahoma, uh, they were very savvy in that they figured out a way to sort of write a contract where they bought the land very inexpensively, but they retained mineral rights. And the area of land that their reservation lands are over happens to be some of the biggest oil reserves anywhere. So they were all sitting on this gold mine, basically. And so despite the fact that they had, in many cases, really limited legal status or citizen status as Americans, they were landowners who owned mineral rights and were extremely wealthy. So this community started having questionable deaths and outright murders that were never really solved. And the FBI was eventually called in to try to solve these murders and unexplained deaths. And it was kind of the first big case and the first case that had a lot of publicity for the agency. And so it put the FBI on the map to some extent. The main lawman who was, who focused on this it's kind of your typical sort of Wild West ranger background. And luckily, he was somebody who could not be bought and, you know, genuinely wanted to see justice be done. This book was heartbreaking. It was scary. It was excellent. Five star rating. I highly recommend it. It's a piece of American history that I've I was unaware of, I don't think is taught, and I don't think probably most people know about. This may change. There's, I, I didn't realize this when I started the book. My friend Katie recommended it to me and, and sent me a copy for my birthday to read. There's a movie coming out directed by Martin Scorsese with Leo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro in it, among others. So more people may be aware of it, but I, I would still recommend reading the book. It's very, very good. If you have any interest at all about early 20th century history in America, uh, Native American history that's just not talked about or taught, uh, the history of sort of Western law enforcement, all of that's in there. I Like I said, I read the book in three days. I couldn't put it down. It was so good. So high recommend for that one. Um, Next up, Frog Music, um, which I listened to on audiobook. This is a historical fiction. I also was listening to it on our last podcast, hadn't finished it yet. Um, it's set in San Francisco in the 1880s. There is a smallpox epidemic that is an, out, an outbreak. And the main characters, uh, the main I would say the main character is a soiled dove. This is a woman who she dances as well as works as a prostitute, call girl kind of thing. She has um, her pimp, her man that she lives with and basically gives him all of her money. And she becomes friends with this kind of eccentric character named Jenny who runs into her on one of the big penny wheeler type um, bicycles of the time. So they kind of become an unlikely friend, friend pair, um, Blanche and Jenny. And Jenny is, 
has a colored past. She apparently was a child actor. She now catches frogs for a living for the restaurant trade. And then um, she gets into a lot of trouble. She gets into fights. She drinks a lot. She gets cited by the police because she wears men's clothes. And uh, the book starts out, and this is not a spoiler, the book starts out with Jenny, Jenny's death. She gets shot. And the story of what happened kind of unfolds and it's told in back flash of like how they met and the events leading up to Jenny's death and then a short ending that talks about what happens to Blanche after Jenny dies. So I thought that I would really like this book. It seemed very me. It was, you know, historical fiction, um, interesting characters. It's based on a real news clipping that the author found. And it sounded, it sounded like my kind of book. Um, I could find very little that I liked about it. I finished it. The characters are all not very nice. There's, there's not a lot of redemption in this book. At least there wasn't for me. Um, there's a fair amount of gratuitous sex. Um, fair amount of violence. I would say multiple triggers. Uh, if you have interest in reading the book, I would check those out before you go down that path. Um, yeah, it was not a very nice book. It had great reviews. I didn't care for it. Uh, it was like a C minus for me. So anyway, that's book two. Book three, The Inheritance Games. Um, if you followed me in the Wayback Machine, you might remember that I tore through a series called uh, Truly Devious, which is a young, a, a young adult type book um, about some uh, mysterious shenanigans at a boarding school. This does not have a boarding school in it, but it is very similar in terms of tone. The main character, who's Avery Grams. Um, she uh, has, lot, her mother has recently died. Her father basically isn't in the picture and she lives with her half sister, her older half sister. Um, and they barely get by. They are not, they are not affluent. Um, Avery's very smart, but she doesn't really apply herself very much. And one day she's called into the principal's office where she finds out that she has inherited the estate of this multi-billionaire. She now owns a mansion. She owns a football team. She has um, money, money to burn. But the catch is, is that the inheritance comes with uh, some strings, including that she must live in the mansion for a year and the will disinherits four brothers. Uh, they're all half brothers, but four half brothers um, who all live in the mansion and think that they are going to be getting this inheritance. And there's all kinds of clues and sort of red herrings and hoops to jump through that the um, gentleman who has died and has left her all this stuff has put together that sort of this group of young people must navigate and solve and figure out. And so you don't really know who's on whose side or if everybody's against everybody. There's, you know, lots of plot twists. And this is the first in a series uh, of three, I believe. Really fun writing, really quick paced, also young adult. I really enjoyed the, enjoyed this book. Um, if you liked Truly Devious and you haven't read this series, I think you would like this one as well. Um, I will definitely be reading the next two books in the series um, coming up. So a good one. Uh, next up, I read The Book Eaters by Sunyi Dean. This was my book of the month club for September book. And this, uh, okay, I'm not even sure how to talk about this book. 
the concept is really great, okay? The, the concept is that there is this group of people who consume books. They can gain the knowledge that is in a book or the information that's in a book by actually eating the pages. And so the young women of this magical race are basically fed traditional type fairy tales. They're kept very sequestered and their main life's goal is that they get married and produce an offspring. There's not very many of these creatures. And so it's, they're sort of the last bastion of survival of this race. The young men are fed sort of adventure books and they are the knights and they protect the young women and they uh, are sort of the hierarchy, head of the family types. Um, into all of this, there are members of this race who are born that do not eat books. They eat human brains. It lost me at that point. Um, the first chapter of this book made it so that I almost didn't finish it. It was gratuitous and graphic and I don't like anybody in this book. I loved the, the concept of it, which is, you know, people who like you can learn German by consuming a German dictionary. I love that concept. I think that's great. This book was very intense the it reminded me somewhat of like the handmaiden's tale margaret atwood's book um and i think the other thing that bothered me about this book is we never really find out okay so these people who eat the books can pass well enough um, among human society to, to be part of human society, even if they don't want to really participate with society, human society as we know it. But then they have all these other sort of ve veiled references to like weird things that they do that it made it unbelievable, I, right? It's already unbelievable because these people consume book pages as nourishment. I get it. Anyway, um, this book had a ton of triggers in it. Pretty much anything that you can think of is is in this book. And it's also filled with nasty people. Um, so I was really disappointed in this because I've read good reviews about it where people are like, oh, this is going to be an amazing, amazing book. And like I said, I thought that the concept, the, the first concept was very creative and very interesting. But... This was not, this was billed as a darkly sweet pastry of a book about family betrayal and the lengths we go to for the ones we love. A deliciously modern fairy tale. This book was not that for me. So, um, if you like sort of gothic horror and you're okay with some sort of slasher type stuff, maybe you will enjoy it more than I did, but I was not a fan of this one. And then the last book I read uh, this month is The Red Queen by Philippa Gregory. And this one is um, about Margaret Beaufort slash Henry VII's mother. And so this takes place during the Wars of the Roses. And if you know your British history at all, Henry VII um, kills, not necessarily personally, but his army defeats Richard III, who is the last York king, and it puts the Lancasters back on the throne. Um, this author is the author of The Other Boleyn Girl. She tends to write that period history from a female point of view, um, which this one is as well. Uh, good, but not great. Uh, I think part of it was I had a hard time getting behind Margaret as a person because she is, she's very devout doing God's will, which I have, it's hard for me to understand someone who bases their entire life's decisions on the, the 
feeling, the fact, their personal belief that they are God's chosen. So I found her difficult to empathize with, but in terms of presenting who she was and her very strong backbone to make sure that her son, who had been <clears throat> either very, so far down the line of succession, nobody cared about him, or because of a series of deaths, um, became the next in line to the throne and therefore a threat to the Yorkists. That was very interesting. And I think that, that this is the first book I've read that really explains the genetic lines in a way that makes sense to understand even how the Tudors got onto the throne. So if you like historical fiction about the sort of late medieval War of the Roses into the Tudor period, this was a fun read. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit and, you know, it's historical fiction. So there's definitely parts of it that the author embellishes or expands on that they don't really know the details about, but definitely entertaining. And so what I'm reading right now is um, the third book in Cass Cassie Clare's Shadow Hunters series of seven, City of Glass, uh, which I'm buddy reading with a friend. So we'll talk about more uh, of that next time that I'm with you all. So stay tuned. And we'll go and talk about cross stitch next. So last but certainly not least, uh, let me show you my current progress on the Desert Mandala by Chatelaine, which I've been working on. This has been my focus piece uh, for most of this year and will continue to be until I get it finished, but definitely in the home stretch. All right. So since you last saw it, I think, if I remember correctly, I have finished this section and I have started on the feather and the cactus and that's a little extra something something. And I have been working on mapping out the final landscape vignette that lives here. I did not get much done on this. Uh, the week before we went on, on our holiday was crazy at work. Uh, and then we were out of town last weekend, but I am here this weekend and um, my husband is away again. So this is my focus for the next couple of days. And my plan is to finish getting the cactus and feather borders that go right here and here done and then finish this border. So all I'm doing then is, is going to have the nature scene at all the nature scene and the landscape. Um, so I don't think, uh, despite what some of you have said that I will definitely have this done in October, I don't think that that's the case, but I am going to try to make good progress on this over the next couple of weeks before I talk to you guys again and make some real progress on it. So, uh, I still will have the, the beads, the big beads. It's got the smaller ones in there, but these bigger, um, like medallion, square beads that live here um, and uh, elsewhere up above this. Uh, those will still need to be done, but I, that's not going to be like a multi-week project. That's going to be a focused weekend or part of a week kind of, kind of thing. Anyway, so this again is the Desert Mandalow by Chatelaine. This is the last sections that I have to go and then uh, I will move on to other things. Now, those other things are going to most likely be mostly full coverage. Uh, I've done, I'm not going to do like a full whip parade of everything that I have because I have a few things that I started in the way back that are bigger pieces that I'm just not sure I'm going to finish. And they're still sitting in timeout, haven't made any like for sure decisions, but I do know that going forward next year and whenever I finish my Chatelaine, uh, I am going to focus on full coverage for the next year, let's call it 12 months. So to that end, what I've done is I've put together a short um, overview of the active 
full coverage projects that I have on the go so that you guys can see all of those. And um, the first piece of that little short video um, are some of the pieces that I know I'm not going to have any chance of finishing in the short term. They're either barely started or ginormous. And so those are just to share with you guys. I will be working on them next year at some point. They will rotate in. But what I wanted from you all is some help picking what's going to be my focus project for next year. And that's sort of the second half of that little video where you can see what the options are and you can pick and choose to help me decide uh, what I should focus on. Now, several of you have already said, I don't need to see that stuff. I want you to work on Winner's Encounter with the horse. So duly noted, your votes have already been counted. You certainly can vote again if you'd like, but, um, but I know that that one is also near and dear to my heart and many of you like that one quite a bit too. So I will send you uh, back in time to the quick video that I shot. It's about 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll hop back on just to close up things. Um, forewarned that it was handheld. It was with my iPhone so that I could move stuff around a little more easily. Uh, so the quality is not the best. So my apologies for that. Do the best you can. Um, I know most of you have already seen those. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy this little clip and I will be back shortly. Hey everyone. Uh, this is going to be the video that talks about my current in progress full coverage pieces. So you guys can kind of see what I've not shown for a while. And we'll look at maybe what I'm going to focus on for 2023. And you can let me know your preference for things that I should focus on. Uh, so this will be kind of a mini whip parade because uh, most of this stuff has not seen the light of day in a while since I've been focused on my desert mandala. So let's start with this one. Um, this is not a contender to be finished next year by any stretch of the imagination. This is, um, and I should say all of these designs are charted by Heaven and Earth Designs um with various artwork this is one of the amy stewart pieces i'm sure you're familiar with if you are a full coverage stitcher this is the fairy tale bookshelf once upon a time this is my current progress on it um so not very much but i'm starting this is the bottom edge and i'm working my way up uh this is the center it's massive it's not going to get not going to get finished next year or possibly this decade, but this is where I am on that. Just to remind you of it. Um, if I have some time next year, I'd love to be able to finish this little bit and maybe bring this section up and also even this section out. So I kind of have all of this done, but, um, since we're going to focus for this video on things that I am going to prioritize, this will get some work next year, but it won't be, it won't be a priority. Next up, let's look at, uh, this is Beloved um, by Adele Sessler, artwork by Adele Sessler. Um, I'm looking to see if I have the print Hang on. Yep, here it is. Okay, so this is as far as I've gotten, which is basically page one. It's a monochromatic piece that looks like that. This one is also not going to be a priority for next year because obviously with just one page done, it's not going to get finished. But one of my favorites and will also be out for some time next year, not as a focus piece, but some progress. Okay, then let's look at this one next. Again, not a ton of uh, progress on it. I'm still actually working on page one. This is called What You're Reading, and it is max color version of this piece of art by Stephanie Law. Uh, the dragon, the girl and her cat, and I am currently working up here in this corner with those trees. So 
not a ton done on it, but it started and again, we'll get some time next year, just not a focus piece. Okay, so those one, two, three pieces are ones you'll see next year, but they aren't going to be focus pieces or anything that I'm even remotely close to finishing, which is totally fine, but that's where I am on all of those. Okay, now the next thing that I'm going to share is a stitching shelf. So you can see, uh, last time I worked on this, I got started on the second uh, row of pages. This is um, another Amy Stewart design that I'm sure y'all are familiar with. And I have the top row of pages done. Finished that up last year. So there's all of that. Um, so this is not a piece that I think I can finish next year, but it is my oldest full coverage piece. I would like to get some good progress on it. So it's a contender for a focus piece, knowing that I won't get it finished. It, if, if it winds up being, um, the piece that I pull out every single month, you know, obviously I'll make more progress on it than one that I might pull out every three or four months to do two weeks on. So possibility number one. Possibility number two, and this one I think I could get finished next year. And that is the ornament version of A Long Winter's Nap. So this one, uh, the artwork is by Donna Gelsinger. And it's one of the circular ones. Here's what it's going to look like when it's done. So I've made pretty good progress on it. I've gotten kind of this section right here done. Um, and I'm working on it in this fashion. So I kind of will end up over here with the cat because that's my favorite part is the sleeping kitty. Uh, but here's where I am on this one. So... This one is a possibility. So you can think about whether or not that's realistic or uh, I probably have, so this is like one full page right here, this section right here. I have a full page that will be over here and I have like most of a page and a slight partial that will finish this corner. Then I have one full two mostly full and some partial pieces. You can kind of see where I've started to bring the curve of that up. So maybe it's a third finished-ish, but that is an option. Next up is which way? And I have, I think I'm about at 45% on this one. So uh, I finished the whole top across. This is a mini. Let me show you the artwork here. Artwork by Molly Harrison. So I've finished basically from here up on this side. Sorry for the glare. And I'm working my way back across in that direction to work on her dress and the rest of her cape and her gorgeous hair. So I'm working this way. So for this one, I've got two more full pages to finish here. And then I've got three more full pages across the bottom and then some very short, I think they're only like two columns or two squares deep to finish across the bottom. So basically five full pages left to go on this one. So that's close-ish. And then the final category candidate in this set is My Winter's Encounter. This is artwork by Laura Prindle. And again, this is a mini. So here's, here's what it's going to look like. And I am about there on it. Which is not quite at the halfway point, but pretty, pretty darn close. 
So here's, here's where I've obviously stitched to, and this is the entire height of this piece. So it's only two and a little bit pages um, high. And then I have going in this way, I believe just about three pages across to finish this. So this is the final candidate for my, my focus for next year. So the plan for how I want to divvy things up is for every month, I want to work two weeks on whatever my focus piece is, whatever that is chosen. And then I will work on one of the other pieces that I've shown you today as the other two weeks in the month. And I'll kind of rotate through them. So you'll see all of these next year. It's just a matter of which piece gets the most focus. And I know some of you have already voted for this. Um, and this is a favorite of mine too. So um, not to bias anyone, but it may be something that you enjoy too and want to see more work on. Um, so tell me what you think. Leave me a comment down below if there's one of these pieces that really sparked your interest and you'd love to see me kind of push, push towards at least getting closer. Um, I'm not 100% confident given my decreased stitching time as it stands currently with all my life changes in the last year, whether or not this is, is realistic to say, yes, you know, if we pick a mini, I for sure can get it done, but I would like to think that 26 weeks of time on a project will get me much, much closer to that finish line. Um, so that's where we stand right now. Uh, I, please, again, please leave me a comment. Let me know which of these you'd like to see as my focus piece for next year. Um, and I'm going to return you now back to current time, Anne. Talk to you there. Okay, so back, back to the future. Uh, that is uh, the list of the projects that I have. Would love to hear your input as to which one you think should be my focus project for next year. And then which one is maybe your second choice. And we'll tally those votes up and then whatever y'all pick is what I will focus on for, um, not necessarily a focus for a finish, but the project that I'm going to get the most done on for next year. So that is it from me today to you. I hope that everybody's having a, a good start to your October. And if you're enjoying fall weather or spring weather, depending on your hemisphere, um, I hope that you have an opportunity to do some things outside that you enjoy, uh, as well as some indoor crafting time. Um, as always, thank you again for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, leave me a comment. I love interacting with you guys through this platform. And um, as always, a list of the show notes and information and links will be included as well in the description box below. So I will talk to you guys probably middle of the month. Um, not sure what day will work, but we'll make something happen. Um, and so until then, uh, happy listening, happy crafting, happy reading. Bye.